Chapter One of The Clue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Clue by Carolyn Wells. Chapter One The Van Normans. The old Van Norman mansion was the finest house in Mapleton. Well back from the road, it sat proudly among its finely kept lawns and gardens, as if with a dignified sense of its own importance, and its white colonial columns gleamed through the trees like sentinels guarding the entrance to the stately hall. All Mapleton was proud of the picturesque old place, and it was shown to visiting strangers with the same pride that the native villagers pointed out the memorial library and the new church. More than a half-century old, the patrician white house seemed to glance coldly on the upstart cottages, whose inadequate pillars supporting beetling second stories, and whose spacious filigreed verandas left woefully small area for rooms inside the house. The Van Norman mansion was not like that. It was a long rectangle, and each of its four stories was a series of commodious, well-shaped apartments. And its owner, the beautiful Madeline Van Norman, was the most envied as well as the most admired young woman in the town. Magnificent Madeline, as she was sometimes called, was of the haughty, imperious type, which inspires admiration and respect rather than love. An orphan and an heiress, she had lived all of her twenty-two years of life in the old house, and since the death of her uncle, two years before, had continued as mistress of the place, ably assisted by a pleasant motherly chaperone, a clever social secretary, and a corps of capable servants. The mansion itself and an income amply sufficient to maintain it were already legally her own, but by the terms of her uncle's will she was soon to come into possession of the bulk of the great fortune he had left. Madeline was the only living descendant of old Richard Van Norman, save for one distant cousin, a young man of a scapegrace and ne'er-do-well sort, who of late years had lived abroad. This young man's early life had been spent in Mapleton, but his fiery temper having brought about a serious quarrel with his uncle, he had wisely concluded to take himself out of the way. And yet Tom Willard was not of a quarrelsome disposition. His bad temper was of the impulsive sort, roused suddenly, and as quickly suppressed. Nor was it often in evidence. Good-natured, easy-going Tom would put up with his uncle's criticism and fault-finding for weeks at a time, and then, perhaps goaded beyond endurance, he would fly into a rage and express himself in fluent, if rather vigorous, English. For Richard Van Norman had been by no means an easy man to live with, and it was Tom's general amiability that had made him the usual scapegoat for his uncle's ill temper. Miss Madeline would have none of it. Quite as dictatorial as the old man himself, she allowed no interference with her own plans and no criticism of her own actions. This had proved the right way to manage Mr. Van Norman, and he had always acceded to Madeline's requests or submitted to her decrees without objection, though there had never been any demonstration of affection between the two. But demonstration was quite foreign to the nature of both uncle and niece, and in truth they were really fond of each other in their quiet, reserved way. Tom Willard was different. His affection was of the honest and outspoken sort, and he made friends easily, though he often lost them with equal rapidity. On account, then, of his devotion to Madeline and his enmity toward young Tom Willard, Richard Van Norman had willed the old place to his niece, 
and had further directed that the whole of his large fortune should be unrestrictedly bestowed upon her on her wedding day or on her twenty-third birthday should she reach that age unmarried in event of her death before her marriage and also before her twenty-third birthday the whole estate would go to tom willard it was with the greatest reluctance that richard van norman decreed this but a provision had to be made in case of madeline's early death and willard was the only other natural heir and now at twenty-two madeline was on the eve of marriage to schuyler carleton a member of one of the oldest and best families of mapleton the village gossips were pleased to commend this union as mr carleton was a man of irreproachable habits and handsome enough to appear well beside the magnificent madeline he was not a rich man but as her marriage would bring her inheritance they could rank among the millionaires of the day yet there were those who feared for the future happiness of this apparently ideal couple mrs markham who was both housekeeper and chaperone to her young charge mourned in secret over the attitude of the betrothed pair he adores her i'm sure she said to herself but he is too courtly and polished in his manner i'd rather he would impulsively caress her or involuntarily call her by some endearing name than to be always so exquisitely deferential and polite and madeline must love him or why should she marry him yet she is so haughty and formal she might be a very duchess instead of a young american girl but that's madeline all over i've never seen her exhibit any real emotion over anything ah well i'm an old-fashioned fool doubtless they're cooing doves when alone together but their high-bred notions won't allow any sentiment shown before other people but i almost wish she were going to marry tom he has sentiment and enthusiasm enough for two and the relationship is so distant it's not worth thinking about dear old tom he's the only one who ever stirs madeline out of that dignified calm of hers and that was true enough madeline had inherited the van norman traits of dignity and reserve to such an extent that it was difficult for any one to be a really close friend she had too a strange little air of preoccupation and even when interested in a conversation would appear to look through or beyond her companion in a way that was discouraging to the average caller so miss van norman was by no means a favorite with the mapleton young people on a personal sense but socially she was their leader and to be on her invitation list was the highest aspiration of the village climbers and now that she was about to marry schuyler carleton the event of the wedding was the only thing talked of thought of or dreamed of by mapleton society madeline who always kept in touch with tom willard by correspondence had written him of her approaching marriage and he had responded by coming at once to america to attend the ceremony relieved from the embarrassment of his uncle's presence tom was his jovial self and showed forth all the reprehensible attractiveness which so often belongs to the scapegrace nature he sometimes quarreled with madeline over trifles then making up next minute he would caress and pet her with the privileged air of a relative he was glad to be back among the familiar scenes of mapleton and he went about the town renewing old acquaintances and making new ones and charming all by his winning personality in less than a week he had more friends in the village than schuyler carleton had ever made carleton though handsome and distinguished looking was absolutely without personal magnetism or charm which traits were found in abundance in tom willard the friends of schuyler carleton attributed his reserved almost repellent demeanor to shyness and this was partly true 
his acquaintances said it was indifference and this again was partly true then his enemies of which he had some vowed that his cold curt manner of speech was merely snobbishness and this was not true at all his manner toward his fiancée was all that the most exacting could require in the matter of courtesy and punctilious politeness he was markedly undemonstrative in public and if this were true of his behavior when the two were alone it was probably because madeline herself neither inspired nor desired terms or acts of endearment tom's attitude toward madeline angered carleton extremely but when he spoke to her on the subject he was gaily informed that the matter of cousinly affection was outside the jurisdiction of a fiance tom on his part was desperately in love with madeline and had been for years repeatedly he had begged her to marry him and she knew in her heart that his plea was prompted by his love for herself and not by any consideration of her fortune and yet should she marry another all hope of his uncle's money would be forever lost to tom willard but prodigal and spendthrift that he was if tom felt any regret at his vanishing fortunes he showed no sign of it save for sudden and often easily provoked bursts of temper he was infectiously gay and merry and was the life of the house party already gathered under madeline's roof the fact that tom was staying at the van norman house which of course carleton could not do gave willard advantage over the prospective bridegroom of which he was by no means unconscious partly to tease the imperturbable but jealous carleton and partly because of his own affection for his cousin tom devoted himself assiduously to madeline especially when carleton was present you see maddy tom would say there are only a few days left of our boy and girl chumminess i fancy that after you are married schuyler won't let me speak to you save in most formal terms so i must see all i can of you now then he would tuck her arm through his own and take her for a stroll in the grounds and carleton coming to search for her would find them cosily chatting in a secluded arbor or drifting lazily in a canoe on the tiny lily-padded lake these things greatly annoyed schuyler carleton but remonstrance was never an easy task for him nor did it ever affect madeline pleasantly i wish madeline he had said one day when he had waited two hours for her to return from a drive with tom that you would have a little regard for appearances if you have none for my wishes it is not seemly for my betrothed wife to be driving all over the country with another man magnificent madeline looked straight at him tilting her head back slightly to look beneath her half-closed lids it is not seemly she said for my betrothed husband to imply that i could be at fault in a matter of propriety or punctilio that is not possible you are right he said and his eyes gleamed with admiration of her glorious beauty and imperious manner forgive me you are indeed right though schuyler carleton may not have been lavish of affection he begrudged no admiration to the splendid woman he had won and yet had he but known it the apparently scornful and haughty girl was craving a more tender and gentle love and would gladly have forgone his admiration to have received more affection but it will come madeline thought to herself i am not of the clinging vine type i know but after we are married surely schuyler will be less formally polite and more well chummy yet madeline herself was chummy with nobody save tom they two were always chatting and laughing together and though they differed sometimes 
and even quarrelled, it was quickly made up and forgotten in a new subject of merry discussion. But, after all, they rarely quarrelled except regarding Madeline's approaching marriage. "'Don't throw yourself away on that iceberg, Maddy,' Tom would plead. "'He's a truly fine man, I know, but he can't make you happy.' "'How absurd you are, Tom. Give me credit, please, for knowing my own mind, at least. I love Schuyler Carleton, and I am proud that he is to be my husband.' He is the finest man I have ever known in every way, and I am a fortunate girl to be chosen by such a man. Oh, ho, Maddy, don't do the humble. It doesn't suit you at all. You are the type who ought to have kings and crown princes at your feet, and Carlton is princely enough in his effects, but he's by no means at your feet. What do you mean? exclaimed Madeline angrily. "'Just what I say. Schuyler Carleton admires you greatly, but he doesn't love you, at least not as I do.' "'Don't be foolish, Tom. Naturally, you know nothing about Mr. Carleton's affection for me. He does not proclaim it from the housetops, and I desire you not to speak of it again.' why should i speak of what doesn't exist forgive me maddy but i love you so myself it drives me frantic to see ye that man treating you so coolly he doesn't treat me coolly or if he does it's because i don't wish for tender demonstrations before other people i'm fond of you tom as you know but i won't allow even you to criticize the man i am about to marry Oh, very well, marry him then, and a precious unhappy life you'll lead with him, and I know why. Madeline turned on him, her eyes blazing with anger. What do you mean? Explain that last remark of yours. Small need. You know why as well as I do and Tom pushed his hands into his pockets and strode away, whistling, well knowing that he had roused his cousin's even temper at last. In addition to some of her Mapleton friends, Madeline had invited two girls from New York to be her bridesmaids. Kitty French and Molly Gardner had already come and were staying at the Van Norman house the few days that would intervene before the wedding. Knowing Madeline well as they did, they had not expected confidence from her, nor did they look forward to cozy romantic boudoir chats such as many girls would enjoy. But neither had they expected the peculiar constraint that seemed to hang over all the members of the household. Mrs. Markham had been so long housekeeper and even companion for Madeline that she was not looked upon as a servant and to her Kitty French put a few discreet questions regarding the exceeding reserve of Mr. Carleton. "'I don't know, Miss French,' said the good woman, looking sadly disturbed. "'I love Madeline as I would my own child. I know she adores Mr. Carleton, and, yes, I know he greatly admires her. And yet there is something wrong.' I can't express it. It's merely a feeling, an intuition. But there is something wrong. "'You know Mr. Willard is in love with Maddy,' suggested Miss French. "'Oh, it isn't that. They've always had a cousinly affection for each other, and, yes, Tom is in love with her. But what I mean is aside from all that. The real reason that Madeline flirts with Tom, for she does flirt with him, is to pique Mr. Carleton. There, I've said more than I meant to, but you're too good a friend to let it make any trouble, and, anyway, in a few days they will be married, and then I'm sure it will be all right. I'm sure of it. Like many people, Mrs. Markham emphasized by repetition 
a statement of whose truth she was far from sure. End of chapter 1Chapter Two of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Miss Morton Arrives. The day before the wedding, the old house was a pleasant scene of bustle and confusion. Professional decorators were in charge of the great drawing room, building a canopy of green vines and flowers beneath which the bridal pair should stand the next day at high noon. This work was greatly hindered by a bevy of young people who thought they were helping. At last, noting a look of dumb exasperation on the face of one of the florist's men, Molly Gardner exclaimed, "'I don't believe our help is needed here. Come on, Kitty. Let's go in the library and wait for tea time.' It was nearly five o'clock, and the girls found most of the house guests already assembled in the library, awaiting the arrival of the tea tray. Several other young people were there also, most of them being those who were to be of the wedding cortege next day. Robert Fessenden, who was to be best man, had just come from New York and had dropped in to see Miss Van Norman. Although he was an old friend of Carleton's, Madeline did not know him very well, and though she made him welcome, it was with that coldly formal air that did not greatly attract the young man, but he could not fail to be impressed by her great beauty. "'Lucky fellow, Carleton,' he said to Tom Willard. "'Why, that woman would create a sensation in any great city in the world.' "'Yes, she is too handsome to live all her life in a small village,' agreed Tom. "'I think they intend to travel a great deal. An heiress, too, I believe. Yes, she has all the desirable traits a woman can possess.' "'All?' Fessenden's tone was quizzical. "'What do you mean?' asked Tom sharply. "'Nothing. Only, if I were to marry—' I should prefer a little more softness of nature. Oh, that's only her manner. My cousin is most sweet and womanly, I assure you. I'm sure she is, returned Fessenden, who was a bit ashamed of his outspokenness. And she's getting a sterling good fellow for a husband. She is so, said Tom heartily which was kind of him, considering his own opinion of Carleton. And then both men strolled over to where Madeline sat at the tea-table. She was reading a telegram that had just been brought to her, and she laughingly explained to Tom that it meant a bother for him. "'Miss Morton has concluded to come to the wedding after all,' she said. "'She wrote me that she wouldn't come, but she has changed her mind, it seems. Now, it does sound ridiculous, I know, but in this big house there isn't a room left for her but the one you have, Tom. You see, one bedroom is used for a present room, one is reserved for Schuyler tomorrow, the bridesmaids have another, and except for our own rooms, and those already occupied by guests, there are no more. I hate to ask you, Tom, but could you go to the inn? Sure, Maddy dear, anything to oblige. But it does seem too bad to turn me out of your house the very last day that your hospitality is all your own to offer. Tomorrow the Grand Seigneur will be master here, and my timid little Madeline can no longer call her soul her own. This reference to the tall and stately mistress of the house raised a general laugh, but Madeline did not join in it. "'I'm so sorry, Tom,' she said earnestly, as she looked again at the telegram she was holding. "'But Miss Morton was an old friend of Uncle Richard's, and as she wants to come here, I can't turn her away. And unless you give her your room, there is no other.' "'Nonsense, Madeline. I'm only joking,' 
of course i'll go to the hotel only too glad to accommodate miss morton forget it girl i assure you i don't mind a bit i'll pack up a few traps after dinner and skip down to the picturesque if rather ostentatious mapleton inn as tom spoke he put his arm carelessly round madeline's shoulders and though scarcely more than a cousinly caress it was unfortunate that schuyler carleton should enter the room at that moment a lightning glance flashed between the two men and as tom moved away from madeline with a slightly embarrassed shrug of his shoulders carleton's face grew so stern that an uncomfortable silence fell upon the guests however the arrival of the tea tray saved the situation and madeline at once busied herself in the pretty occupation of serving tea to her guests with an air of jealous proprietorship carleton moved toward her and looking handsome though sulky stood by willard with folded arms as if on guard urged on by a daredevil spirit of mischief and perhaps remembering that madeline would soon be beyond his reach as carleton's wife tom also moved toward her from the other side endeavoring to treat the situation lightly madeline held up a newly filled teacup who will have this she asked gaily i will declared carleton and tom at the same time and each held out a hand madeline looked at them both smilingly carleton's face was white and set he was evidently making a serious matter of the trifling episode tom on the contrary was smiling broadly and was quite evidently enjoying his rival's discomfiture i shall give it to you because you look so pleasant declared madeline handing the cup to tom now schuyler smile prettily and you may have one too but carleton would not fall in with her light mood bending a little he said in a tense voice i will leave you to your cousin now to-morrow i shall assert my claim though not rude in themselves the words were accompanied by a harsh and disdainful glance that made several of the onlookers wondered what sort of a life the haughty madeline would lead with such a coldly tyrannical husband the brute said tom under his breath as carleton left the room never mind maddy the old turk has left you to me for this evening and we'll take him at his word suddenly madeline's mood changed to one of utter gaiety she smiled impartially on all she jested with the girls she bewitched the young men with her merry banter and she almost seemed to be flirting with tom willard but he was her cousin after all and much is forgiven a bride-to-be on her wedding eve robert fessenden looked at miss van norman with a puzzled air he couldn't seem to understand her and was glad when by chance the two were left comparatively alone for a few moments conversation a great responsibility devolves on the best man miss van norman he said in response to a chaffing remark of hers i suppose that to-morrow i shall be general director-in-chief and if anything should go wrong i shall be blamed but nothing will go wrong said madeline gaily and then think how you'll be praised ah but you won't be here to hear the praise heaped upon me so what's the use no i shall be gone forever said madeline putting on one of her far-away looks i never want to come back to mapleton i hate it why miss van norman you want to desert this beautiful old house schuyler can never find you a home so comfortable and attractive in every way i don't care i want to go far away from mapleton to live we're going to travel for a year anyway but when we do settle down it will be abroad i hope you surprise me 
Schuyler didn't tell me this. We've been chums so long that I usually know of his plans. But, of course, getting married changes all that. "'You're a very intimate friend of Mr. Carleton's, aren't you?' said Madeline, with a strange note of wistfulness in her voice. "'Yes, I am. Why?' "'Oh, nothing. I only thought—I mean, do you think—' Rob Fessenden was thrilled by the plaintive expression on the beautiful face, and suddenly felt a great desire to help this girl, who was seemingly so far above and beyond all need of help, and yet was surely about to ask his aid, or at least his sympathy. "'Don't hesitate,' he said gently. "'What is it, Miss Van Norman?' I want to be as firm a friend of yours as I am of Schuyler's, so please say what you wish to. I can't, I can't, Madeline whispered, and her voice was almost a moan. Please, again urged Fessenden. Do you know Dorothy Burt? Madeline then broke out, as if the words were fairly forced from her. No said Fessenden, amazed. I never heard the name before. Who is she? Hush! She's nobody, less than nobody. Don't mention her to me ever again, nor to anyone else. Ah, here comes Miss Morton. As Fessenden watched Madeline, she changed swiftly from a perturbed, troubled girl to a courteous, polished hostess. "'My dear Miss Morton,' she said, advancing to meet her newest guest, "'how kind of you to come to me at this time.' "'I didn't come exactly out of kindness,' said Miss Morton, "'but because I desired to come. "'I hope you are quite well. "'Will you give me some tea?' Miss Morton was a tall, angular lady, with gray hair and sharp black eyes. She seemed to bite off her words at the ends of her short sentences, and had a brisk, alert manner that was, in a way, aggressive. "'An eccentric,' Rob Fessenden thought, as he looked at her and wondered why she was there at all. "'An old sweetheart of Mr. Richard Van Norman, I believe,' said Kitty French when he questioned her. They were once engaged, and then quarreled and broke it off and neither of them lived happily ever after. "'As the Carltons will,' said Fessenden, smiling. "'Yes,' said Kitty slowly. "'As the Carltons will, I hope. "'You know Mr. Carlton awfully well, don't you? "'Are you sure he will make our Maddie happy, Mr. Fessenden?' "'I think so.' and Fessenden tried to speak casually. He is not an emotional man, or one greatly given to sentiment, but I judge she is not that sort either. Oh, yes, she is. Maddie is apparently cold and cynical, but she isn't really so a bit. But she perfectly adores him, and if they're not happy, it won't be her fault. Nor will it be his said Fessenden, warmly defending his absent friend. Carlton's an old trump. There's no finer man in the world, and any woman ought to be happy with him. I'm glad to hear you say that, said Kitty with a little sigh of relief. Do look at that funny Miss Morton. She seems to be scolding Madeline. I'm sorry she came. She doesn't seem very attractive but perhaps it's because she was crossed in love and it made her queer or she was queered in love and it made her cross laughed fessenden well i must go now and look up carlton poor old boy he was a little miffed when he went away after tea all the callers departed and those who were house guests went to their rooms to dress for dinner Tom Willard, with great show of burlesque regret and tearful farewells, went to the hotel, 
that Miss Morton might have the room he had been occupying. He promised to return for dinner, and gaily blew kisses to Madeline, as with his traps he was driven down the avenue. At dinner, Schuyler Carleton's place was vacant. It had been arranged next to Madeline's, and when fifteen minutes after the dinner hour he had not arrived, she haughtily accepted Tom Willard's arm and led the way to the dining room. But having reached the table, she directed Tom to take his rightful seat at some distance from her own, and Carlton's chair remained empty at Madeline's side. At first this was uncomfortably evident, but Madeline was in gay spirits, and soon the whole party followed her lead, and the conversation was general and in a merry key. The young hostess had never looked more regally beautiful. Her dark hair, piled high on her head, was adorned with a dainty ornament which, though only a twisted ribbon, was shaped like a crown and gave her the effect of an imperious queen. Her low-cut gown of pale yellow satin was severe of line and accented her stately bearing, while her exquisitely mottled neck and shoulders were as white and pure as those of a marble statue. Save for a double row of pearls around her throat, she wore no ornaments, but on the morrow Carlton's gift of magnificent diamonds would grace her bridal costume. The combination of haughty imperial beauty and a dazzling witchery of mood was irresistible, and the men and girls alike realized that never before had Madeline seemed so wonderful. After the dessert was placed on the table, Willard could stand it no longer, and leaving his own place, he calmly appropriated Carlton's vacant chair. Madeline did not reprove him, and Kitty French took occasion to whisper to her neighbor, "'Twere better by far to have matched our fair cousin to brave Lochinvar." Mrs. Markham overheard the quotation, and a look of pain came into her eyes. But it was all too late now, and tomorrow Madeline would be irrevocably Schuyler Carleton's wife. After dinner, coffee was served in the cozy library. Madeline preferred this room to the more elaborately furnished drawing room, and tonight her word was law. But suddenly her mood changed. For no apparent reason, her gay spirits vanished. Her smile faded away, and a pathetic droop curved the corners of her beautiful mouth. At about ten o'clock, she said abruptly, though gently, "'I wish you'd all go to bed. Unless you girls get some beauty sleep, you won't look pretty at my wedding tomorrow.' "'I'm quite ready to go,' declared Kitty French with some tact, for she saw that Madeline was nervous and strung up to a high tension. "'I, too,' exclaimed Molly Gardner and the two girls said good night and went upstairs. Two or three young men who had been dinner guests also made their adieu, and Tom Willard said, "'Well, I may as well toddle to my comforts of home, as understood by a country innkeeper.' Madeline said good night to him kindly enough, but without jest or gaiety. Tom looked at her curiously for a moment, and then, gently kissing her hand, he went away. Mrs. Markham, having seen Miss Morton comfortably installed in what had been Tom's room, returned to the library to offer her services to Madeline. But the girl only thanked her, saying, "'There is nothing you can do tonight. I want to be alone for an hour or two. I will stay here in the library for a time, and I'd like to have you send Cicely to me. A few moments later, Cicely Dupuy came in, bringing some letters and papers. She was Miss Van Norman's private secretary, and admirably did she fill the post. 
quick-witted, clever, deft of hand and brain, she answered notes, kept accounts, and in many ways made herself invaluable to her employer. Moreover, Madeline liked her. Cicely was of a charming personality. Small, fair, with big childish blue eyes and a rose-leaf skin, she was a pretty picture to look at. "'Sit down,' said Madeline, "'and make a little list of some final matters I want you to attend to tomorrow.' Cicely sat down, and taking pencil and tablet from the library table, made the lists as Madeline directed. This occupied but a short time, and then Miss Van Norman said wearily, "'You may go now, Cicely. Go to bed at once, dear. You will have much to do tomorrow. And please tell Marie I shall not need her services tonight. She may go to her room. I shall sit here for an hour or more, and I will answer these notes. I wish to be alone.' "'Very well, Miss Van Norman,' said Cicely, and taking the list she had made, she went softly from the room. End of chapter 2"'Chapter 3 of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 A Cry in the Night "'Help!' The loud cry of a single word was not repeated, but repetition was unnecessary, for the sound rang through the old Van Norman house and carried its message of fear and horror to all, awake or sleeping, within its walls. It was about half-past eleven that same night, and Cicely Dupuy, still fully dressed, flew from her bedroom out into the hall. Seeing a light downstairs and hearing the servants' bells, one after another, as if rung by a frantic hand, she hesitated a moment only and then ran downstairs. In the lower hall, Schuyler Carleton, with a dazed expression on his white-drawn face, was uncertainly pushing various electric buttons which, in turn, flashed lights on or off, or rang bells in distant parts of the house. For a moment Cicely stared straight at the man. Their eyes met, their gaze seemed to concentrate, and they stood motionless as if spellbound. This crisis was broken in upon by Marie, Madeline's French maid, who came running downstairs in a hastily donned negligee. "'Mon Dieu!' she cried. "'Où est mademoiselle?' With a start, Carlton turned from Cicely, and still with that dazed look on his face, he motioned Marie toward the wide doorway of the library. The girl took a step toward the threshold and then, with a shriek, paused and ventured no further. Cicely, as if impelled by an unseen force, slowly turned and followed Marie's movements, and as the girl screamed, Cicely grasped her tightly by the arm, and the two stood staring in at the library door. What they saw was Madeline Van Norman, seated in a chair at the library table. Her right arm was on the table, and her head, which had fallen to one side, was supported by her right shoulder. Her eyes were partly closed, and her lips were parted, and the position of the rigid figure left no need for further evidence that this was not a natural sleep. But further evidence there was. Miss Van Norman still wore her yellow satin gown, but the beautiful embroidered bodice was stained a dull red and a crimson stream was even then spreading its way down the shimmering breadths of the trailing skirt. On the table, near the outstretched white hand, lay a Venetian dagger. This dagger was well known to the onlookers. It had lain on the library table for many years, and though ostensibly for the purpose of a paper-cutter, it was rarely used as such. 
its edges were too sharp to cut paper satisfactorily and moreover it was a wicked-looking affair and many people had shuddered as they touched it it had a history too and richard van norman used to tell his guests of dark deeds in which the dagger had taken part while it was still in italy madeline herself had had a horror of the weapon though she had often admitted the fascination of its marvelous workmanship and had said upon several occasions that the thing fairly hypnotized her and some day she should kill herself or somebody else with it from an instinctive sense of duty marie started forward as if to help her mistress then with a convulsive shudder she screamed again and clasped her hands before her eyes to shut out the awful sight cicely too moved slowly toward the silent figure then turned and again gazed steadfastly at schuyler carleton there must have been interrogation in her eyes for the man pointed toward the table and cicely looked again to notice there a bit of paper with writing on it she made no motion toward it but the expression on her face changed to one of bewildered surprise before she had time to speak however the other people of the house all at once began to gather in the hall mrs markham came first and though when she saw madeline she turned very white and seemed about to faint she bravely went at once toward the girl and gently tried to raise the fallen head she felt a firm grasp on her shoulder and turned to see miss morton with a stern set face at her side don't touch her said miss morton in a whisper telephone for a doctor quickly but she's dead declared mrs markham at the same time bursting into violent sobs we do not know we hope not went on miss morton and without another word she led mrs markham to a sofa and sat her down rather suddenly and then went herself straight to the telephone as she reached it she paused only to inquire the name of the family physician harris the butler with difficulty articulated the name of dr hills and his telephone number and without further inquiry miss morton called for him is this dr hills she said when her call was answered yes this is the van norman house come here at once no matter you must come at once it is very important a matter of life and death i am miss morton i am in charge here yes come immediately good-bye Miss Morton hung up the receiver and turned to the frightened group of servants. "'You can do nothing,' she said, "'and you may as well return to your rooms. Harris may stay, and one of the parlor maids.' Miss Morton had an imperious air, and instinctively the servants obeyed her. But Cicely Dupuy was not so ready to accept the dictum of a stranger she stepped forward and facing miss morton said quietly mrs markham is housekeeper as well as miss van norman's chaperone the servants are accustomed to take their orders from her miss morton returned cicely's direct gaze you see mrs markham she said pointing to the sofa where that lady had entirely collapsed and with her head in a pillow was shaking with convulsive sobs she is for the moment quite incapable of giving orders as the oldest person present and as a lifelong friend of mr richard van norman i shall take the liberty of directing affairs in the present crisis then in a softer tone and with a glance toward madeline miss morton continued i trust in view of the awfulness of the occasion you will give me your sympathy and cooperation that we may work in harmony cicely gave miss morton a curious glance that might have meant almost anything but with a slight inclination of her head she said only yes madam 
Then Kitty French and Molly Gardner came downstairs and stood trembling on the threshold. "'What is it?' whispered Kitty. "'What's the matter with Madeline?' "'Something dreadful has happened,' said Miss Morton, meeting them at the door. "'I have telephoned for Dr. Hills, and he will be here soon. Until then we can do nothing.' "'But we can try to help Maddy,' exclaimed Kitty, starting toward the still figure by the table. "'Oh, is she hurt? I thought she had fainted.' As the two girls saw the dread sight, Miss Gardner fainted herself, and Miss Morton bade Marie, who stood shivering in the hall, take care of her. Relieved at having something to do, Marie shook the girl and dashed water in her face until she regained consciousness, the others meanwhile paying little attention. Schuyler Carleton stood leaning against the doorpost, his eyes fixed on Madeline's tragic figure, while Kitty French, who had dropped into a chair, sat with her hands tightly clasped, also gazing at the sad picture. Although it seemed hours to those who awaited him, it was but a few moments before the doctor came. Dr. Hills was a clean-cut, alert-looking young man, and his quick eyes seemed to take in every detail of the scene at a glance. He went straight to the girl at the table and bent over her. Only the briefest examination was necessary before he said gently, "'She is quite dead. She has been stabbed with this dagger. It entered a large blood vessel just over her heart, and she bled to death. Who killed her?' Even as he spoke, his eye fell on the written paper which lay on the table. With one of his habitually quick gestures, he snatched it up and read it to himself, while a look of great surprise dawned on his face. Immediately he read it aloud. I am wholly miserable, and unless the clouds lift, I must end my life. I love S., but he does not love me. After he finished reading, Dr. Hills stood staring at the paper and looked utterly perplexed. "'I should have said it was not a suicide,' he declared, "'but this message seems to indicate that it is. Is this written in Miss Van Norman's hand?' Miss Morton, who stood at the doctor's side, took the paper and scrutinized it. "'It is,' she said. Yes, certainly that is Miss Van Norman's writing. I had a letter from her only a few days ago, and I recognize it perfectly. Let me see it, said Mrs. Markham, in a determined, though rather timid way. I am more familiar with Madeline's writing than a stranger can possibly be. Miss Morton handed the paper to the housekeeper without a word, while the doctor, waiting, wondered why these two women seemed so out of sympathy with each other. "'Yes, it is surely Madeline's writing,' agreed Mrs. Markham, her glasses dropping off as her eyes filled with tears. "'Then I suppose she killed herself, poor girl,' said the doctor. "'She must have been desperate indeed, for it was a strong blow that drove the steel in so deeply.' Who first discovered her here? I did, said Schuyler Carleton, stepping forward. His face was almost as white as the dead girl's, and he was scarcely able to make his voice heard. I came in with a latch key and found her here, just as you see her now. As Carleton spoke, Cicely Dupuy stared at him with that curious expression that seemed to show something more than grief and horror. Her emotional bewilderment was not surprising in view of the awful situation, but her look was a strange one, and for some reason it greatly disconcerted the man. None of this escaped the notice of Dr. Hills. Looking straight at Carleton, but with a kindly expression replacing the stern look on his face, he went on, 
And when you came in, was Miss Van Norman just as we see her now? Practically, said Carlton. I couldn't believe her dead, and I tried to rouse her. Then I saw the dagger on the floor at her feet. On the floor? interrupted Dr. Hills. Yes, replied Carlton, whose agitation was increasing, and who had sunk into a chair because of sheer inability to stand. It was on the floor at her feet, right at her feet. I picked it up, and there was blood on it. There is blood on it, and I laid it on the table. And then I saw the paper, the paper that says she killed herself. And then, and then I turned on the lights and rang the servants' bells. And Cicely, Miss Dupuy, came, and the others, and that's all. Schuyler Carleton had with difficulty concluded his narration, and he sat clenching his hands and biting his lips, as if at the very limit of his powers of endurance. Dr. Hills again glanced round the assembly in that quick way of his, and said, "'Did any of you have reason to think Miss Van Norman had any thoughts of taking her own life?' For a moment no one spoke, and then Kitty French, who in a despairing, miserable way was huddled in the depths of a great armchair, said, I have heard Madeline say that sometimes she would kill herself with that horrid old dagger. I wish I had stolen it and buried it long ago. Dr. Hills turned to Mrs. Markham. Did you have any reason to fear this? he inquired. No, she replied, and I do not think Madeline meant she would voluntarily use that dagger. She only meant she had a superstitious dread of the thing. "'Do you understand her references to her own unhappiness in this bit of writing?' went on the doctor. "'Yes, I think I do,' said Mrs. Markham in a low voice. "'That is enough for the present,' said the doctor, as if to interrupt further confidences. Although it is difficult to believe a stab of that nature could be self-inflicted, it is possible, and this communication seems to leave no room for doubt. Now, the law of New Jersey requires that in case of a death not by natural means, the county physician shall be summoned, and further proceedings are entirely at his discretion. I shall therefore be obliged to send for Dr. Leonard, before disturbing the body in any way. He will probably not arrive in less than an hour or so, and I would advise that you ladies retire. You can, of course, do nothing to help, and as I shall remain in charge, you may as well get what rest you can during the night. I thank you for your consideration, Dr. Hills, said Mrs. Markham, who seemed to have recovered her calmness but I prefer to stay here. I could not rest after this awful shock, and I cannot stay away from Madeline. Kitty French and Molly Gardner, who, clasped in each other's arms, were shivering with excitement and grief, begged to be allowed to stay too, but Dr. Hills peremptorily ordered them to go to their rooms. Cicely Dupuy was allowed to stay, as in her position of social secretary she might know much of Madeline's private affairs. For the same reason Marie was detained, while Dr. Hills asked her a few questions. Schuyler Carleton sat rigidly in his chair, as immovable as a statue. This man puzzled Dr. Hills, and yet it was surely shock enough almost to unhinge a man's brain thus to find his intended bride the night before his wedding. But Carleton seemed absorbed in emotions other than those of grief. Though his face was impassive, his eyes darted about the room, looking at one after another of the shocked and terrified group, returning always to the still figure at the table, and as quickly turning his gaze away 
as if the sight were unbearable, as indeed it was. He seemed like a man stunned with the awfulness of the tragedy, and yet conscious of a care, a responsibility, which he could not shake off. If inadvertently his eyes met those of Miss Dupuy, he shifted his gaze immediately. If by chance he encountered Mrs. Markham's sad glance, he turned away, unable to bear it. In a word, he was like a man at the limit of his endurance, and seemed veritably on the verge of collapse. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Suicide or Miss Morton also seemed to have distracting thoughts. She sat down on the sofa beside Mrs. Markham, then she jumped up suddenly and started for the door only to turn about and resume her seat on the sofa. Here she sat for a few moments apparently in deep thought. Then she rose and slowly stalked from the room and went upstairs. After a few moments Marie, the French maid, also rose and silently left the room. Having concluded it was a case for the county physician, Dr. Hills apparently considered that his personal responsibility was at an end, and he sat quietly awaiting the coming of his colleague. After a time, Miss Morton returned, and again took her seat on the sofa. She looked excited and a little flurried, but strove to appear calm. It was a dreadful hour. Only rarely anyone spoke and though glances sometimes shot from the eyes of one to the eyes of another, each felt his gaze oftenest impelled toward that dread, beautiful figure by the table. At last Schuyler Carleton, with an evident effort, said suddenly, "'Oughtn't we to send for Tom Willard?' Mrs. Markham gave a start. "'Of course we must,' she said. "'Poor Tom!' He must be told. Who will tell him? I will, volunteered Miss Morton, and Dr. Hills looked up, amazed at her calm tone. This woman puzzled him, and he could not understand her continued attempts at authority in a household where she was a comparative stranger. And yet might it not be merely a kind consideration for those who were nearer and dearer to the principles of this awful tragedy? But even as he thought this over, Miss Morton had gone to the telephone, her heavy silk gown rustling as she crossed the room, and her every movement assertive of her own importance. Calling up the Mapleton Inn, she succeeded, after several attempts, in rousing some of its occupants, and finally was in communication with young Willard himself. She did not tell him of the tragedy, but only asked him to come over to the house at once, as something serious had happened, and returned to her seat with a murmured observation that Tom would arrive as soon as possible. Again the little group lapsed into silence. Cicely Dupuy was very nervous, and kept picking at her handkerchief, quite unconscious that she was ruining its delicate lace edge. Dr. Hills glanced furtively from one to another. Many things puzzled him, but most of all he was at a loss to understand the suicide of this beautiful girl on the very eve of her wedding. At last Tom Willard came. Miss Morton met him at the door and took him into the drawing-room before he could turn toward the library. Schuyler Carleton's frantic touches on various electric buttons had turned on all the lights in the drawing-room. As no one had noticed this, the great apartment had remained illuminated as if for a festivity, and the soft bright lights fell on the floral bower and the elaborate decorations that had been arranged for the wedding day. "'What is it?' 
asked Tom, his own face white with an impending sense of dread as he looked into Miss Morton's eyes. As gently as possible, but in her own straightforward and inevitably somewhat abrupt way, Miss Morton told him. "'I want to warn you,' she said, "'to prepare for a shock, and I think it kinder to tell you the truth at once. Your cousin Madeline, Miss Van Norman, has taken her own life.' "'What?' Tom almost shouted the word and his face showed an absolutely uncomprehending amazement. "'She killed herself tonight,' Miss Morton went on, whose efforts were now directed toward making the young man understand, rather than toward sparing his feelings. But Tom could not seem to grasp it. "'What do you mean?' he said, catching her by both arms. "'Madeline? Killed herself?' yes said miss morton shaken out of her own calm by tom's excited voice in the library after we had all gone to bed she stabbed herself with that horrible paper cutter thing did you know she was unhappy unhappy no why should she be tomorrow was to have been her wedding day today corrected miss morton it is already the day on which our dear Madeline was to have become a bride, and instead, glancing around the brilliant room and at the bridal bower, Miss Morton's composure gave way entirely, and she sobbed hysterically. At this, Cicely Dupuy came across from the library. Putting her arm around Miss Morton, she led the sobbing woman away, and without a word to Tom Willard, gave him a glance which seemed to say that he must look out for himself, for her duty was to attend Miss Morton. As the two women left the drawing-room, Tom followed them. He walked slowly and stared about as if uncertain where to go. He paused a moment midway in the room and, stooping, picked up some small object from the carpet which he put in his waistcoat pocket. A moment more, and he had crossed the hall and stood at the library door, gazing at the scene which had already shocked and saddened the others. With a groan, as of utter anguish, Tom involuntarily put up one hand before his eyes. Then, pulling himself together with an effort, he seemed to dash away a tear, and walked into the room, saying almost harshly, "'What does it mean?' Dr. Hills rose to meet him, and by way of a brief explanation, he put into Tom's hand the paper he had found on the table. Tom read the written message, and looked more stupefied than ever. With a sudden gesture, he turned toward Schuyler Carleton and said in a low voice, "'But you did love her, didn't you?' "'I did.' replied Carlton simply. "'Why should she have thought you didn't?' went on Tom, looking at the paper, and seeming to soliloquize rather than to address his questions to anyone else. As this was the first time that the S in Madeline's note had been openly assumed to stand for Schuyler Carlton, there was a stir of excitement all around the room. I don't know, said Carlton, but a dull red flush spread over his white face and his voice trembled. You don't know, said Tom in cutting tones. Man, you must know. But no reply was made, and dropping into a chair, Tom buried his face in both hands and remained thus for a long time. Tom Willard was a large, stout man, and possessed of the genial and merry demeanor which so often accompanies Avoidupois. Save for his occasional, though really rare, bursts of temper, Tom was always in joking and laughing mood. To see him thus in an agonized, speechless despair 
deeply affected Mrs. Markham. Tom had always been a favorite with her, and not even Madeline had regretted more than she the estrangement between Richard Van Norman and his nephew. And even as Mrs. Markham looked at the bowed head of the great strong man, she suddenly bethought herself for the first time that Tom was now heir to the Van Norman fortune. She wondered if he had himself yet realized it, and then she scolded herself for letting such thoughts intrude so unfittingly soon. And yet she well knew that it would not be in ordinary human nature long to ignore the fact of such a sudden change of fortunes. As she looked at Tom, her glance strayed toward Mr. Carleton, and then the thought struck her that what Tom had gained, this man had lost. For had Madeline lived, the Van Norman money would have been, in a way, at the disposal of her husband. The girl's death then would make Tom a rich man, while Schuyler Carleton would remain poor. He had always been poor, or at least far from wealthy, and more than one gossip was of the opinion that he had wooed Miss Van Norman not entirely because of disinterested love for her. While Mrs. Markham was busy with these fast-following thoughts, a voice in the doorway made her look up. A quiet, unimportant-looking man stood there and was respectfully addressing Dr. Hills. "'I'm Hunt, sir,' he said a plain clothesman from headquarters. All three men in the room gave a start of surprise, and each turned an inquiring look at the newcomer. "'Who sent you, and what for?' asked Dr. Hills. "'I've been here all night, sir. I'm on guard in the present room upstairs.' "'I engaged him,' said Mrs. Markham. Madeline's presents are very valuable, and although the jewels are still in the bank, the silver and other things upstairs are worth a large amount, and I thought best to have this man remain here during the night. "'A very wise precaution, Mrs. Markham,' said Dr. Hills. "'And why did you leave your post, my man?' "'The butler told me of what had happened.' and I wondered if I might be of any service down here. I left the butler in charge of the room while I came down to inquire. "'Very thoughtful of you,' said Dr. Hills, with a nod of appreciation. "'And while I hardly think so, we may have use for you before the night is over. I am expecting Dr. Leonard, the county physician, and until he comes I can do nothing.' I am sure the room above is sufficiently guarded for the time being, so suppose you sit down here a few minutes and wait. Mr. Hunt chose to take a seat in the hall, just outside the library door, and thus added one more solemn presence to the quietly waiting group. And now Dr. Hills had occasion to add another puzzling condition to those that had already confronted him. Almost every one in the room was curiously affected by the appearance of this detective, or plain clothesman, as he was called. Schuyler Carleton gave a start, and his pale face became whiter yet. Cicely Dupuy looked at him, and then, turning her glance toward Mr. Hunt, whom she could see through the doorway, she favored the latter with a stare of such venomous hatred that Dr. Hills, with difficulty, repressed an exclamation. Cicely's big blue eyes roved from Hunt to Carlton and back again, and her little hands clenched as with a firm resolve of some sort in her mind. She seemed to brace herself for action. Her hovering glances annoyed Carlton. He grew nervous and at last stared straight at her, when her own eyes dropped and she blushed rosy red. But this side play was observed by no one but Dr. Hills, 
for the others were evidently absorbed in serious thoughts of their own concerning the advent of Mr. Hunt. Tom Willard stared at him in a sort of perplexity, but Tom's good-natured face had worn that perplexed look ever since he had heard the awful news. He seemed unable to understand, or even to grasp the facts so clearly visible before him. But Miss Morton was more disturbed than anyone else. She looked at Hunt, and an expression of fear came into her eyes. She fidgeted about. She felt in her pocket. She changed her seat twice, and she repeatedly asked Dr. Hills if he thought Dr. Leonard would arrive soon. Dr. Leonard did not live in Mapleton, but motored over from his home in a nearby village. He was a stranger to all those awaiting in the Van Norman house, with the exception of Dr. Hills. Unlike that pleasant-mannered young man, Dr. Leonard was middle-aged, of a crusty disposition and curt speech. When he came, Dr. Hills presented him to the ladies, and before he had time to introduce the two men, Dr. Leonard said crossly, "'Put the women out. I cannot conduct this affair with petticoats and hysterics around me.' Though not meant to reach the ears of the ladies, the speech was fairly audible, and with a trace of indignation Miss Morton arose and left the room. Mrs. Markham followed her, and Cicely went also. Dr. Leonard closed the library doors, and turning to Dr. Hills, asked for a concise statement of what had happened. In his straightforward manner, Dr. Hills gave a brief outline of the case, including all the necessary details. And yet, he concluded, even in the face of that written message, I cannot think it a suicide. Of course it's a suicide, declared Dr. Leonard in his blustering way. There is no question whatever. The written confession which you all declare to be in her handwriting is ample proof that the girl killed herself. Of course you had to send for me. The stupid old laws of New Jersey make it imperative that I shall be dragged out many miles away from my home for every death that isn't in conventional deathbed fashion. But there is no suspicion of foul play here. The poor girl chose to kill herself and she has done so with the means which she found near at hand. I will write the burial certificate and leave it with you. There is no occasion for the coroner. "'Thank God for that!' exclaimed Schuyler Carleton in a fervent tone. "'Amen!' said Tom. "'It's dreadful enough to think of poor Maddie as she is. But had it been anyone else who... Unheeding the ejaculation of these two men, Dr. Hills said earnestly, "'But, doctor, if it had not been for the written paper, would you have called it a suicide?' "'That has nothing to do with the case,' declared Dr. Leonard, testily. "'The paper is there and is authentic. No sane man could doubt that it is a suicide after that.' But, Dr. Leonard, it would seem impossible for a woman to stab herself at that angle, and with such an astonishing degree of force, also to pull the dagger from the wound, cast it on the floor, and then to place her arm in that particular position on the table. Why do you say in that particular position? because the position of her right arm is as if thrown there carelessly, and not as if flung there in death agony. You are imaginative, Dr. Hills. The facts may not seem possible, but since they are the facts, you must admit that they are possible. Very well, Dr. Leonard. I accept your decision and I relinquish all professional responsibility in the matter. You may do so, 
there is no occasion for mystery or question it is a sad affair indeed but no crime is indicated beyond that of self-destruction the written confession hints at the motive for the deed but that is outside my jurisdiction who is the man in the hall i fancied him a detective he is that is he is a man from headquarters who is here to watch over the bridal gifts he came downstairs thinking we might require his services in another way send him back to his post there is no work for detectives just because a young girl chose to end her unhappy life dr hills opened the library door and directed hunt to return to his place in the present room dr leonard still with his harsh and disagreeable manner advised willard and carleton to go to their homes saying he and dr hills would remain in charge of the library for the rest of the night dr hills found the women in the drawing-room awaiting such message as dr leonard might have for them dr hills told them all that dr leonard had said and advised them to retire as the next day would be indeed a difficult and sorrowful one end of chapter four Chapter Five of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five A Case for the Coroner. It was characteristic of Miss Morton that she went straight to her own room and shut the door. Mrs. Markham, on the other hand, went to the room occupied by Kitty French. Molly Gardner was there too and the two girls, robed in kimonas, were sitting white-faced and tearful-eyed, waiting for some further news from the room whence they had been banished. Mrs. Markham told them what Dr. Leonard had said, but Kitty French broke out impetuously, "'Madeline never killed herself, never. I know she always said that about the dagger, but she never really meant it and anyway she never would have done it the night before her wedding i tell you she didn't do it it was some horrid burglar who came in to steal her presents who killed her i would almost rather it had been so kitty dear said mrs markham gently stroking the brow of the excited girl but it could not have been for we are very strong locks and bolts against burglars and Harris is very careful in his precautions for our safety. I don't care. Maddy never killed herself. She wouldn't do it. I know her too well. Oh, dear, now there won't be any wedding at all. Isn't it dreadful to think of that decorated room and the bower we planned for the bride? At these thoughts, Kitty's tears began to flow afresh and Molly, who was already limp from weeping, joined her. "'There, there,' said Mrs. Markham, gently patting Molly's shoulder. "'Don't cry so, dearie. It can't do any good, and you'll just make yourself ill.' "'But I don't understand,' said Molly, as she mopped her eyes with her wet ball of a handkerchief. "'Why did she kill herself?' i don't know said mrs markham but her expression seemed to betoken a sad suspicion she didn't kill herself reiterated kitty i stick to that but if she did i know why this feminine absence of logic was unremarked by her hearers who both said why because schuyler didn't love her enough said kitty earnestly she just worshipped him, and he used to care more for her, but lately he hasn't. "'How do you know?' asked Molly. "'Oh, Madeline didn't tell me,' returned Kitty. "'I just gathered it. I've been here most a week, 
you know I came several days before you did, Molly, and I've noticed her a lot. Oh, I don't mean I spied on her, or anything horrid. Only I couldn't help seeing that she wished Mr. Carlton would be more attentive. Why, I thought he was awfully attentive, said Molly. Oh, attentive, yes. I don't exactly mean that. But there was something lacking. Don't you think so, Mrs. Markham? Yes, Kitty, I do think so. In fact, I know that Mr. Carlton didn't give Madeline the heart-whole affection that she gave him. But I hoped it would all turn out all right, and I surely never dreamed it was such a serious matter as to bring Madeline to this. But she was a reserved, proud nature, and if she thought Mr. Carlton had ceased to love her, I know she would far rather die than marry him. "'But she could have refused to marry him,' cried Molly. "'She didn't have to kill herself to get rid of him.' "'She didn't kill herself,' stubbornly repeated Kitty, but Mrs. Markham said, "'Don't you understand Maddy's nature, Molly? She must have had some sudden and positive proof of Mr. Carlton's lack of true affection for her to drive her to this step.' But once convinced that he did not care for her, I know her absolute despair would impel her to the desperate deed. "'Why didn't he love her?' said Molly, who could see no reason why any man shouldn't love the magnificent Madeline. "'I think,' said Kitty slowly, "'there was somebody else.' "'How did you know that?' exclaimed Mrs. Markham sharply as if she had detected Kitty in some wrongdoing. "'I don't know it, but I can't help thinking so. Madeline has sometimes asked me if I didn't think most men preferred gentle, timid disposition to a strong, capable nature like her own. Of course, she didn't express it just like that, but she hinted at it so wistfully that I told her no. She was the splendidest, most adorable woman in the whole world. I meant it, too. But at the same time, I do think men most always love the soft, tractable kind of girls that are not so imperious and awe-inspiring as Maddie was. Surely Kitty ought to know, for she was the most delicious type of soft, tractable femininity. Her round, dimpled face was positively peachy, and her curling tendrils of goldy hair clustered round a low white brow above appealing violet eyes. A man might admire the haughty Madeline, but he would caressingly love bewitching little Kitty, and would involuntarily feel a sense of protection toward her because of the shy trustfulness in her glance. This was not entirely ingenuous, for a wise little kitty quite understood her own charm, but it was natural, and in no way forced, and she was quite content that her lines had fallen in her own pleasant places, and she left the magnificent Madelines of the world to pursue their own roles. But she had admired and loved Maddy Van Norman, and just because of their differing natures, had understood why Schuyler Carlton's affection was tempered with a certain sense of inferiority. "'You know,' she went on, as if thinking aloud, "'everybody was a little afraid of magnificent Maddy. She was so superb, so regal. You couldn't imagine yourself cuddling her.' "'I should say not,' exclaimed Molly. "'I could only imagine salaaming to her.' or deferentially kissing her hand. Yes, that's what I mean. Well, Mr. Carlton got tired of that stilted kind of an attitude, or at least she thought he did. I don't know, I'm sure, but she was possessed with a notion that he cared for some other girl, someone of the clinging rosebud sort. Do you know this? asked Mrs. Markham. I mean, do you know that Maddy thought this? Yes, I know it, 
asserted Kitty, with a wag of her wise little head. I tried to persuade her that no clinging rosebud could rival a tall, proud lily, but she thoroughly believed there was someone else. "'But Mr. Carlton was to marry her,' said Mrs. Markham. "'I can't believe he would do that if he loved another.' "'That's what bothered Maddy,' said Kitty. She knew how honorable Mr. Carlton had always been, and she said that as he was engaged to her, he would think it his duty to marry her, even though his heart belonged to someone else. "'Oh, pshaw!' said Molly. If he was going to marry her and didn't love her, it was because of her fortune. Probably his rosebud girl hasn't a cent. "'Don't talk like that,' said Kitty, shuddering. Somehow it seems disloyal to both of them. "'But it is all true,' said Mrs. Markham sadly. "'Madeline has never been of a confidential nature, but I know that she had the idea Kitty tells of, and I fear it was true. And I may be disloyal or even unjust, but I can't help thinking Schuyler was attracted to Maddy's money. He is proud and ambitious.' and he would be quite in his element as the head of a fine establishment with plenty of money to spend on it well he'll never have it now said molly and as this brought back the realization of the awful event that had happened both girls burst into crying again mrs markham herself with overwrought nerves found she could do nothing to comfort the girls so left them and went to commune with her grief in her own room. Meantime, the two doctors alone in the library were still in discussion. "'Well, what do you want?' inquired Dr. Leonard angrily. "'Do you want to imply, and with no evidence whatever, that the girl died by some hand other than her own? Do you want to involve the family in the expense and unpleasant publicity of a coroner's inquest, when there is not only no reason for such a proceeding, but there is every reason against it? I want nothing but to get at the truth, rejoined Dr. Hills, a little ruffled himself. I hold that a young woman, unless endowed with unusual strength, or possibly under stress of intense passion, could not inflict upon herself a blow strong enough to drive that dagger to the hilt in her own breast, pull it forth again, and cast it on the floor, and after that place her arm in the position it now occupies. Dr. Leonard looked thoughtful. "'I agree with you,' he said slowly. "'That is, I agree that it does not seem as if a woman could do that.' but my dear dr hills miss van norman did do that we know she did from her own written confession and also by the theory of elimination what else could have happened have you any suggestions to advance dr hills was somewhat taken aback at dr leonard's suddenness up to this moment the county physician had stoutly maintained that the case was a suicide beyond any question, and then, turning, he had put the question to the younger doctor in such a way that Dr. Hills was not quite ready with an answer. "'No,' he said hesitatingly. "'I have no theory to advance, and, moreover, I do not consider this an occasion for theories.' but we must ascertain the facts. I state it as a fact that a woman could not stab herself as Miss Van Norman is stabbed, withdraw the dagger, and then place her right arm on the table in the position you see it. And I assert that you are stating what is not a fact, but merely your own opinion. Dr. Hills looked disconcerted at this. His companion was an older and far more experienced man than himself, and not only did Dr. Hills have no desire to antagonize him, but he wished to show him the deference that was justly his due. "'You are right,' he said frankly. 
it is merely my own opinion but now will you give me yours based not on the written paper but in the position and general effect of the body of miss van norman put thus in his metal dr leonard looked carefully at the dead girl whose pose was so natural and graceful that she might have been merely sitting there resting he gazed long and intently and then said slowly i see your point dr hills it was a vigorous blow suddenly and forcefully given it could scarcely have been done had the subject been a frail slight woman but miss van norman was of a strong even athletic build and her whole physical make-up indicates strength and force of muscle your observation as to her apparent natural position is all right so far as it goes but i have observed more carefully still and i notice her evident physical strength which was doubtless greatly aided by her stress of mental passion and i aver that a woman of her physique could have driven the blow removed the weapon and perhaps even then unconscious have thrown her arm on the table as we now see it i thank you dr leonard said young hills for your patience with me you are doubtless right and i frankly admit you have made out a clear case miss van norman was indeed a strong woman i have been the family physician for several years and i know her robust constitution knowing this and appreciating your superior judgment as to the possibility of the deed i am forced to admit your opinion is the true one and yet besides dr hills went on dr leonard as the younger man hesitated we cannot we must not ignore the written paper why should we do so those who know tell us miss van norman wrote it it is therefore her dying statement dare we disregard her last message written in explanation of her otherwise inexplicable act we may wonder at this suicide we may shudder at it but we may not doubt that it is a suicide that paper is not merely evidence it is testimony it is incontrovertible proof dr leonard ceased speaking and sat silent because he had nothing more to say dr hills also sat silent because try as he might he could not feel convinced that the older physician was right it was absurd he well knew but every time he glanced at the relaxed pose of that white right arm on the table he felt more than ever sure that it had lain there just so when the dagger entered the girl's breast. As the two men sat there, almost as motionless as the other still figure, both saw the knob of the door turn. They had closed the double doors leading to the hall on the arrival of Dr. Leonard, and now the knob of one of them was slowly and noiselessly turning round. A glance of recognition passed between them, but neither spoke or moved. A moment later, the knob having turned completely round, the door began to open very slowly. Owing to the position of the two men, it was necessary for the door to be opened far enough to admit the intruder's head before they could be seen, and the doctors waited breathlessly to see who it might be who desired to come stealthily to the library that night. Dr. Hills, whose thoughts worked quickly, had already assumed it was Mrs. Markham coming to gaze once more on her beloved mistress, but Dr. Leonard formulated no supposition and merely wanted to see. At the edge of the door appeared first a yellow pompadour, followed by the wide-open blue eyes of Cicely Dupuy. Seeing the two men, she came no further into the room, but gave a sort of gasp and pulled the door quickly shut again. In the still house, 
the two listeners could hear her footsteps crossing the hall and ascending the stairs. "'Curious, that,' murmured Dr. Hills. "'If she wanted to look once more on Miss Van Norman's face, why so stealthy about it? And if she didn't want that, what did she want?' "'I don't know,' rejoined Dr. Leonard. "'But I see nothing suspicious about it. Doubtless she did come for a last glance alone at Miss Van Norman, but seeing us here didn't care to enter. But she gave a strange little shuddering gasp, as if frightened. Natural excitement at the strange and awful conditions now present. Yes, no doubt, Dr. Hill spoke a bit impatiently. The phlegmatic attitude of his colleague jarred on his own overwrought nerves, and he rose and walked about the room, now and then stopping to scrutinize anew the victim of the cruel dagger. At last he stood still across the table from her, but looking at Dr. Leonard. "'I have no suggestion to make,' he said slowly. "'I have no theory to offer.' but I am firmly convinced that Madeline Van Norman did not strike the blow that took away her life. Perhaps this is more a feeling or an intuition than a logical conviction, but— He hesitated and looked intently at the dead girl, as if trying to force the secret from her. With a sudden start he took a step forward, and as he spoke his voice rang with excitement. "'Dr. Leonard,' he said in a quick, concise voice, "'will you look carefully at that dagger?' "'Yes,' said the older man, impressed by the other's sudden intensity, and, stepping forward, he scrutinized the dagger as it lay on the table, without, however, touching it. "'There is blood on the handle,' went on Dr. Hills. "'Yes, several stains, now dried. "'And do you see any blood on the right hand of Miss Van Norman?' Startled at the implication, Dr. Leonard bent to examine the cold white hand. Not a trace of blood was on it. Instinctively, he looked at the girl's left hand, only to find that also immaculately white. Dr. Leonard stood upright and pulled himself together. "'I was wrong, Dr. Hills,' he said, with a nod which in him betoked an unspoken apology. "'It is a case for the coroner.'" End of chapter 5